Today we're going to look at Acts 9. And just to give a recap of Acts 8, because we had, uh, I shared a different message last week, didn't continue with Acts 9 last week. Uh, in Acts 8, we see Stephen, the young martyr, well, he's being killed under the um, authority of Saul, a very religious, uh, zealous leader, and he approves of Stephen's murder the first Christian, as far as we know from the Bible, to actually die for his faith. And uh, persecution breaks out. We see uh, Philip being sent and all the believers at the time being sent to different parts of, the, uh, parts of the area, to Samaria in particular, a place where Jews would not set foot in. But Jesus, of course, uh, paved the way by walking through Samaria and, and sharing with the woman at the well and so on and so forth. So, the believers are there. Philip is there. Philip is sharing the gospel with people as God leads him to. And then in one occasion, he shares the gospel or he explains the gospel. He explains the message of Jesus to the eunuch from Ethiopia, who is a high ranking official of Queen Candace at the time. And it is, uh, it is believed that it is this Ethiopian who then becomes a Christian who gets baptized as soon as you know, uh, Philip is sharing the word and explaining everything from the book of Isaiah all the way to Jesus. The eunuch gets baptized and it is believed uh, that it is this person who is responsible for the Christian faith entering the country of Ethiopia. Okay, whatever the case, that happens. And so now we enter um, chapter 9. But the point here is even as persecution broke out, as we see in Acts chapter 8, God's will, what God wants, cannot be stopped. It continues. So um, let's get into Acts chapter 9 and I'll just read a bit and, um, you know, we'll look into it as, as we go along. So um, this is Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So, um, as the persecution has started out in Acts 8, as we see, Saul is totally upset and he goes to the highest officials at the time, the high priest, and says, give me permission so I can go hunt these followers of Jesus down. As, he, as they were called then, followers of the way, I want to go hunt these people down and by, you know, bound, bring them bound to Jerusalem as criminals, okay? So he's very zealous. Now, not much is known of Saul at this time. We do realize that eventually he becomes the Apostle Paul and he writes practically most of uh, the uh, New Testament is written as God inspires him. But at this point, not much is known. We know that he learned under Gamaliel a very famous and very popular teacher at the time. He was a very high-ranking teacher, so we know that much. But there is a, there is a verse or where Paul actually kind of gives us a glimpse of um, what he is at the time. So when we go to Philippians 3, 3 through 7, I've scratched out the first and the last verse for a reason because that applies to Paul. But the one in between applies to Saul. So if we want to get a glimpse of Saul's character, besides what we know from Acts 8 and 9, here's what we know. He says in Philippians 3, 4, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised in the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of a Pharisee, Concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So Saul here is saying that if there's anybody who should be proud and boastful, who had it all, who had arrived in every sense of the word, it is me. Because I'm not just from the lowliest of tribes, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I mean, best amongst my people, as for the law, according to rules... I have maintained everything. I'm righteous according to the law. I'm blameless according to the law. And as for zeal, he is persecuting the church. So 
I am upholding my, my religion, my Jewishness, my Jewish faith by persecuting the church. This is the Saul that is persecuting the church at the time. So this is a glimpse of who Saul was before he becomes Paul, okay, before he has an encounter with God. So he, he is, Saul here, as he is persecuting, is the typical person who doesn't know God, who wants to persevere their own way, their old way, the way that they are familiar with, the, the way want, they want to protect. That's what Saul is in this case. He is persecuting the church because in his mind, in his human understanding, in his limited understanding, these people, Jesus, A, was preaching heresy. He was claiming to be God. He was leading people astray. And now these people, even after Jesus has been crucified, they still continue to teach heresy and continue to lead my people away. So I am doing what God wants me to do by putting an end to the way and all the people who are following in the way. This is, this is Saul's profile at this time. So rightfully, he goes to the religious leaders, the only ones who can approve these kind of steps and says, give me authority to arrest and basically drag these people to jail. So this is the religious zealousy of Saul. Okay. So the point that I make first is we are either led by our flesh or led by God's Holy, God's Holy Spirit. At this time, Saul is being led by his understanding. The same way as the religious leaders and the high priests were led by their own understanding, not by God, which led to Jesus being crucified. If they had the Spirit of God in them, they would have known who it was that they were standing in front of when they were questioning Jesus. But they didn't. They had their own understanding, their own limited knowledge. They were preserving themselves. They were only worried about their position and their power. They were not working under the will of God for God's glory. Saul is no different up until now. Okay? So he is being led by the flesh or there are people being led by the Spirit. There is no midway point. There is no half and half. Either our flesh, our selfishness, our physical desires, our own motives and motivations will lead us in life or we will listen to God and allow Him to speak to us and lead us. There is only this or that, no half and half. So the challenge then is, are you like Saul? So notice I, I'm saying, are you like Saul? Are you religiously righteous? Are you more worried about the letter of the law? Are you more checking a rule book saying, I don't do this, I don't do this, I do this, I do this, therefore I'm a great person and therefore I'm justified to do all these things, but not having the Spirit of God lead us? Or how do you deal with, with the souls in the world. Okay, if you are not righteous, self-righteous, or righteous according to the law, or making a list of rules and regulations, not having the Spirit of God, okay, if you're not like that, but how are you dealing with the people who are like that? See, if you're not one of those people, then chances are we're dealing with somebody who's like that, who doesn't have God's Spirit in them. So it's either we're on this side, or we have actually come to know Christ, we have His Spirit, how do we then show the love of Christ to those who may be still stuck on this side, who may not have had an encounter? And that's, and of course, in that also belongs the people who are still beginning to understand the grace of God. They may still have some old mentality. They may have some still, some old behavioral patterns, old attitudes that God is trying to purge out as they are learning their place here. But we as Christians, how mature are we? How much is the Spirit of God at work in us that we know through the Spirit of God how to deal with those who are on this side and have yet to cross over or are still learning what it means to be a Christian? That's the personal challenge for us. We can't be like a soul. Of course, we want to be like a Paul, but we also need to learn how to deal righteously properly in a godly way with those who do not yet know Christ or those who are still learning 
what it means to know Christ. So now, continuing, he's got his permission. He's on his way. Okay. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. And suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Now here I'm actually going to switch to the King James Version because a lot of the modern translations actually leave certain verses out in this particular passage. So I'm going to switch to verse 5 uh, in King James. It says, and he said, this is uh, Saul speaking, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And it's continued, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goads in some translations. And then coming back to 6, he says, But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul stood up from the ground, and through his eyes, though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. It actually says in um, the King James Version, actually says that he arose... Um, and he was trembling. He was fearful. Okay, as who wouldn't be? If you are walking down the road on on your way somewhere, and a blinding line appear, light appears, and something like this happens, uh, I would be a little bit terrified myself too. Okay, so here's the encounter that Saul now has with Jesus. Let's see what this encounter then teaches us about God, about Saul. First off. Nobody is outside of God's reach, not even a persecutor or worse, a murderer. We know that Saul was directly responsible for Stephen being murdered. He could have stopped it. He could have said, that's enough. Don't stone the boy. You know, this is a young man anymore. He's learned his lesson. But he stood there and he approved the scriptures. The Bible tells us that Saul approved the murder of Stephen. So he is a murderer. So it is this murderer, this persecutor of the church, who is zealous for stopping the followers of Jesus, who is now having an encounter. Jesus could have utterly ignored him and destroyed him. He could have. But instead, he had an encounter with Saul. Okay? And here is the question. The, the, the question that is asked, you know, first off, Jesus asks the question, Why are you persecuting me? doesn't introduce himself as, Hi, I'm Jesus, and I'm going to ask you a question. He just asks a question. You know, there's a booming voice that Saul's hearing, and he sees the blinding light, and there's a question. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, Saul knows there is no other people around. It's not his traveling companions who is speaking. So he rightfully asks, Who are you, Lord? Using the Old Testament name of God. Who are you? He knows it is God speaking to him. So he says, who are you, Lord? And that is that pivotal question every one of us at some point have asked or ought to ask. Who are you, Lord? We have an encounter. We have an encounter with God on a regular basis, on a daily basis. We encounter God. But do we then dare to ask that question? Who are you, Lord? Or do we ignore it and go, I don't care. This is nothing. It's whatever. No. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked that question. And Jesus answers. That's the thing. Whenever we have a question towards God, when we ask in honesty, in humility, with sincerity, God always answers. God always responds when the question is asked in sincerity. And then Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, Saul was fully aware of the message of Jesus. 
He knew of Jesus. There is no doubt about it. If all the religious leaders knew who uh, Jesus was and what he was teaching, Saul was a Pharisee. He knew full well the message of the gospel. He knew what Jesus said about himself. He knew Jesus equated himself with God. Jesus said, I am God to all the religious leaders. That's why they wanted to stone him. That's why they wanted to kill him. And that's how they successfully manipulated the system and got Jesus killed. So Saul knew everything that Jesus had taught. And here was Jesus. This is why Jesus didn't go into great lengths to explain from the Old Testament and, you know, the Psalms and the Proverbs. He didn't do any of that. He just said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So here's (coughs) something to remember. When somebody persecutes a follower of Jesus, it's not just the follower they are persecuting. Jesus owns the persecution and says, you are persecuting me. What a comforting thing that our God, our Jesus says, no, uh, you know, uh, it's not me. I went to the cross. I'm done. It's all on you now. No, he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You're not just persecuting my people. You're persecuting me. That's what Jesus says. And then, you know, I don't understand why some of the translations leave it out. Jesus says, it's hard for you to kick against the goads or the pricks. So, so, and you go, okay, what does that even mean? Well, from back in the day, if you were living around that time, it would have made absolute sense to Saul and anybody else who read it. So if a farmer is actually leading an ox on the farm, tilling the ground, they have a sharp pointy stick that they direct the animal with. Prick this way, go this way. Prick this way, go that way. Sometimes when the animal, when the ox is actually rebellious and goes, well, I'm not going to do it, they kick against it. But the problem is they're actually kicking against what they shouldn't be touching in the first place. So they're actually causing themselves more harm when they actually kick against the pricks or the goads. So that's why Jesus is saying you can't kick against the pricks or the goads. Why? Because Jesus is saying, I am God. I am going to direct you. So don't fight me. Let me direct you. That's what Jesus is telling Saul. Okay. So God wants Saul to go in the right direction. He was going in the wrong direction. We know this where we are, standing where we are right now, we know this. But he didn't at the time because he was in his zealousness, in his zeal for the Jewish faith, in his zeal for the religious order and everything else. He was like, I'm doing the right thing. But God was saying, no, how gracious is God that before he would commit more atrocities, he would meet Saul and the way he did. And he says, let me direct you. And then, <coughs> then Saul asks, Lord, what do you want me to do? So there is no fight. There is no argument. What do you want me to do? And that's the response. So here Saul has a blinding, you know, encounter with Jesus, but he is not blinded. Yes, he is physically blinded, but no longer will he be spiritually blinded. The process of conversion is now taking place. He's had an encounter with God and he's asked the question, two questions that are key. The first question is pivotal. Who are you, Lord? Peter also gave an answer when Jesus asked them, who do you say I am? A question directed at the individual, a question directed at Saul, who am I or who are you, Lord? Lord, what do you want me to do? He was trembling and he was astonished. Be willing to listen. If you're asking a question, you've got to listen. Don't ask the question and ignore the answer. Ask the question, wait for the answer. Divine encounter should be followed by definite obedience. There is no half and half. If you have an encounter with Christ, if you have an encounter with the Lord, you must obey. What good it would it be for me if, you know, Jesus saves me and then he's asked me to do something. He goes, no, that's not convenient. It's not convenient for my plan. It's not convenient for my lifestyle. It's not convenient for this, that and the other reason. I either obey, I'm a follower of Jesus and I obey, or I don't. It's this way or that. There is no midway for each one of us. That's true. 
For each one of us, there's a calling. It's entirely up to you. Paul, uh, sorry, Saul asked the question and Saul obeyed. <clears throat> so Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing and leading him by the hand, they brought him. His companions brought him into Damascus. Be ready to be humbled. Be ready to be humble. When we have an encounter with the Lord, when we have an encounter with Christ, He will humble us. And there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with humility. Jesus had humility. He laid aside a lot of who He was to come down to earth to walk amongst us, to teach us, and then to die for us. If He, our God, has done that, then how much more should we be willing to humble ourselves and have some of these lessons, some of these hard lessons learned? Because guess what? Saul was without sight. He was, he, he could see. We know he could see, but for three days he was blind. And it is said that he didn't eat or drink. Now, whether he was fasting or not, we're not really certain. But it is clear he chose not to eat or drink. Blind people can eat and drink. There's nothing wrong with that. But he chose perhaps not to eat. Perhaps he was praying. Who knows what he was doing for those three days. But whatever he was doing, chances are he would have been fasting because that would have been something very familiar to him at the time. Okay. Saul was waiting on the Lord. Why? Because Jesus said, go and I'll tell you what to do. There was no specific direction given. He just said, wait. And so Saul did exactly that. He waited. Three days he waited. Interesting. Three days. Not two, not four, but three. The question then is, <coughs> have you asked that most important question? The challenge is that. Now, it's not just about conversion. It is that question every day that we ask. Who are you, Lord? Who, are, who, who is Jesus to you? Is he just that one-off decision that you make? Or is he that that answer is relevant every day? It's not just relevant six months ago or a year ago or two years ago or 20 years ago. It's relevant every day. It is a confession. It is a declaration. You are Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what Peter said. You are the Christ. So do we then ask that question every day? Have we ever asked that question? Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Jesus? But then the comfort is God will not turn away anyone who submits to him. No one. We can say, oh, that person killed somebody, that person. No, I'll never talk to them. They're a horrible person. I'll never have dealings with this kind of a person and that kind of a person because they have done this and they have done that. Somehow making it look like we are perfect angels who have never done anything wrong. That's human attitude. But here we know our God, whoever comes to him, he won't turn away. Okay, so God will not turn away anyone who submits to him, no matter who they are, no matter their past. Now we come to Ananias. Okay, so one, one side of the whole event has happened. Now we are taken to verse 10. Now there is a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, or Straight Street, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. So we get that indication of, what Saul might be doing. He is praying. Saul's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Hananias, you, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So here's Ananias having an encounter. So Saul has just had an encounter with God, with Jesus. Now Ananias is having an encounter, but Ananias is already a disciple of Jesus. So God calls Ananias and Ananias responds, here I am. God gives direction. Ananias asks for clarification. God says, hey, I want you to go to this house on this street and ask for this man. And I want you to pray for him. 
So Ananias doesn't question and doesn't fight God. There's humility there. He's a disciple. He's a follower. And he goes, Lord, I've heard about this man. He's wanting to harm us, basically. He's harmed your people and he's harmed your saints in Jerusalem. He's come here to do the same thing. It's okay <coughs> to ask for clarification. It is okay. See, our God doesn't strike us down because we share our concern. Okay? So God calls Ananias' response. Are you obedient when God speaks to you? When God says your name in your spirit, you know he's asking you to do something or he's wanting a response or are you too busy? Are you too busy with the things of the world, with the ways of the world, with our plans and our, our purposes and our plans, your plans, your purposes, that you don't even hear the call, let alone respond? Sharing our concern. So Ananias goes, but this is the situation with this man. He's, he's not the right kind of person. He shares that concern. But then God confirms by saying, no, I have a plan for this soul. He's going to suffer, but he sees, I've got a plan for him. So God confirms what he was giving, the direction he was giving. And then Ananias conforms and complies. He says, okay, I'll do it. He agrees with God is what God is saying and then he acts on it. He conforms and complies when God confirms. Same thing with us. When we have questions, when we ask, when we ask for clarification or whatever, what is the end response? Is it a response of, yes, Lord, I'll do it. Because you are conforming to God's way and complying to God's direction and God's will? Or is it, yeah, it just doesn't suit. In this time, in this season of my life, I have different plans. It just doesn't quite fit what I have on paper. There's a difference. Because imagine if Ananias had said, no, nah. oh, I can't do it. I won't do it. Now God, of course, would have picked another person to actually do it. But he would have missed out. On the blessings, so that I can imagine how much Paul would have appreciated what is then about to transpire. Okay, so here's the thing: <coughs> we've got to be, we've got to realize that God's word is sufficient. We have this today; it is sufficient. What God said was sufficient for Ananias. God said it. God clarified it, and that was enough for Ananias. There was no further, oh, let me go talk to this person and that person, and let, let's have a group meeting, and let's discuss, and, you know, pros and cons, none of that. God spoke, Ananias asked for clarification because of his relationship, and that was enough. So, and I have a note here, I said, suffering is a part of the journey for some who follow Jesus, but suffering allowed by God aligns with his plan for us as well as others. So he says of Paul that Paul's going to suffer, and he does. But that is a suffering that God has ordained. He has allowed and he has ordained that suffering to happen because there are greater purposes to be fulfilled and accomplished in that suffering. And we see that. We see most of the things that we are reading in the New Testament is because of this Paul who suffered and we have a list of his suffering in another part of the Bible. Oh, I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, I've been jailed, I've been attempted murder, you know, the whole nine yards. He's gone through. So he's going to suffer, but he's suffering because God wants him to suffer for God's glory. Throughout it all, God, of course, delivers him. Okay. But there's a side note where suffering brought about by our own disobedience and lawlessness is not the same as suffering when... God allows the suffering because we are walking on the straight and narrow. But the beauty of it is that even when we bring about stuff on our own head, God will then make it work out when we align with Him. That, that's the beauty of it. He will work all things for those who are called according to His purpose. So when we are walking on the straight and narrow, irrespective of what was done, the consequences of things that we may have done, we cannot escape. But that is not the end of our relationship with God or end of what He can do with us and in our life. So He can then still direct us back on the straight and narrow to fulfill His plans and purposes for our lives. That's the beauty of it. But there is a God-ordained suffering. You might go at times, why is this happening, Lord? I've been following you. I've left the old way. I'm walking on the straight and narrow. I know I am. It's kind of like Job. Job had everything. Job was... You know, Job, in the, book of, in the book of Job, we hear about a man who God basically says, this is the guy. And 
Satan, the devil says, nah, it's because you have blessed him in so many ways. So he has not done anything wrong. And in fact, he actually prays for his children just in case they sinned in their life or whatever. So he's a very godly man and suffering comes upon him, not because of anything he had done or said. It was brought about because God's glory could then be further revealed to all of us. It's the same thing with Saul. He's now about to go through some great trials. So we need to remember that <coughs> us as Christians, we might go through some hard times at times, not because of anything we have said or done. It just comes. And we don't just say, oh, that's life. It's not. Nothing just happens. There is no chance. Nothing happens outside of God's divine providence. If something comes our way, then he is behind it. Nothing is a surprise to him. Nothing is an accident. Everything is in accordance with his will, not just for us individually, but the whole world collectively. Does he want us to suffer and does he want us to be miserable? That's not necessarily the case, but he might allow periods of that to further refine us and make us stronger as individuals and so that we then have a story to share of God's glory with everybody else around us. But we will only receive that kind of suffering and be able to get through it depending on how close a relationship we have with the Lord. And that's where that personal relationships come in. If your personal relationship with God, with the Lord, with Christ isn't strong, then you will falter under the pressures and the trials and the struggles of life. And then people around you will see that your faith isn't all that strong. That your relationship with God isn't all that strong. And they might just go, but I thought you were a Christian. But, you know, I thought you went to church, but I thought, I thought, I thought. Now, we don't pretend to be strong so that other people will praise us. We don't pretend to be great Christians so that other people will think highly of us. We ought to be strong Christians because, guess what, people are always watching. Some people may not come to church. Some people may never read the Bible. Some people will only see other Christians and make, rightly or wrongly, make a judgment call about Jesus based on the kind of Christians that they encounter. Now, we can't be responsible for everybody else out there who calls themselves a Christian, but we can be responsible for ourselves. So the question is, whatever we are going through, good or bad, the way we respond is a choice. And, you know, we were talking about this earlier. It is a choice. How do we respond? And that choice is going to be dictated by the choice we have made concerning Christ. Is he truly, who are you, Lord? You are the son of the living God. You are my Lord and my Savior, or you're just something I do on a Sunday. You're just my pastime. You're just a label I wear. That's it. Now, Ananias departed and entered the house. So he obeys. He doesn't say, I will. He obeys and he goes. He goes into the house and then he is laying his hand on Saul. And look at what he says. Brother Saul. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized. I, I love those verses. Just the way Ananias lays his hand, puts his hand on Saul and says, Brother Saul. You talk about this man who was not sure about Saul, rightly so, because what he had heard was the truth. This Saul is persecuting Christians. He has murdered young Stephen. I am not so sure about this man, Lord. God says, no, nah, don't worry. I've got a plan for him. He's my chosen vessel. Enough for Ananias to then declare to Saul, brother Saul, you are my brother. Not just as a fellow Jew or anything like that. You are my brother in Christ. Brother Saul. And Ananias embraces Saul as his brother in Christ. The question is, how often do we embrace each other? And I'm not just talking about a physical embracing. I'm talking about a spiritual embracing as brothers and sisters in Christ. How often do we do that? That is, you will look... You will love one another just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, men will know that you are disciples if you have love for one another. That's what that love was. Ananias expressed that love. 
to Saul. Then he says, the Lord Jesus, he is confirming to Paul, oh, sorry, to Saul, who he had an encounter with. So hard to call him Saul until he gets, anyway. So he confirms <coughs> to Saul, he declares to Saul that Jesus is Lord, the God of Israel. There is no doubt. So Ananias is telling Saul that it is the Lord God of Israel. Jesus is God, as he said in his message. It is this God that you actually had an encounter with. The Lord Jesus, whom you met, who appeared to you on the road as you came. That he is confirming. Now remember, Saul didn't have a conversation to sit down to you and tell Ananias, Hey, listen to what happened to me. He has just come into the house and he is telling Saul what had just happened that only Saul and his companions knew. And he's telling, yeah, you had an encounter with Jesus on your way. He's confirming this miracle that happened. And, has said, and then he's saying, this Jesus has sent me to you. Remember, Saul was waiting for direction. Saul said, what should I do, Lord? And he said, just go and wait. And here is Ananias coming and saying, is this Jesus who sent me? The, the answer you are waiting for, yeah, I am the answer that you are waiting for, the direction that you were seeking. Ananias is clear on what God has sent him to do for Saul because of his relationship with the Lord, because of his obedience. Ananias is clear. When, there is cl when we have cloud, uh, a kind of cloud hovering over us, not sure of what to do or where to go, it's because we are not necessarily fully seeking Him. Maybe we are distracted. Maybe we are a bit discouraged or disheartened and we are not fully committed to the Lord. That is not to say that sometimes there's a delay in certain answers, but that clarity will come from the Lord. Ananias was clear. I have come here because God has sent me and He wants me to put my hand on you and pray for you so that you will receive your sight and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit is the clarity of that mission for that moment. So here's the challenge then. When God calls you, do you respond? When the name is, oh, Brian or Rob or Louise or whatever, is it, what was that? Oh, whatever. Or is it that there's that close relationship where you know that it's not your inner voice, it is not some random thought, that there is another person wanting to direct you, wanting to get your attention. How close are you with the Lord? that you can hear Him when He calls you. And then, when He does call you, do you respond? That's the other thing. He'll call. Can you hear? Do you respond? But the beautiful thing is, God loves us even when we chicken out. <laughs> okay? That's the beauty of it. Uh, I mean, God knows how many times I've chickened out when He has called me to do something. I mean, of course, five minutes later, I then decided to go obey, but whatever He wanted me to do, the... The time frame had passed, but it's not like God goes, so I don't love you anymore or I love you less. He gives us more opportunities, but it is up to us as Christians to take hold of every opportunity he presents us because the blessing that comes from it may not be material, may not be something substantial that others can see, but it could just simply be a lifting up of our own spirit and a strengthening of our own faith. Ananias responded, and he got to then put his hands on Saul and pray for him and see his side come up, a miracle in itself, and then see this man be filled with the Holy Spirit. And God, in fact, had first told Ananias what he has in store for Saul long before Saul even knew it. Can you imagine God telling you the plans that he has for somebody else if you simply just go and do what he's wanting you to do? Now, how exciting would it have been for Ananias that, oh, wow, not even knowing who this person would end up being. And I can't, you know, sure, we don't know much about Ananias and Saul and, and their interactions later on, but I can only imagine the kind of respect and love Saul or Paul eventually would have for Ananias as a person who obeyed. How many of us can have that relationship with the people who brought us to faith, who shared the gospel with us, who were instrumental in God's plan. Imagine our relationship with those people and then imagine 
the kind of relationship perhaps Saul and or Paul and Ananias had. There was a blessing there for Ananias and of course Saul was of course blessed. But God loves us even when we don't necessarily do what he wants. That shouldn't become our lifestyle and our attitude. Yeah, every once in a while, but the closer we get to the Lord, the stronger our relationship with him becomes, the more we'll be ready and willing to say, yes, Lord, here I am, and actually step out and do what he's calling us to do. Now we see Saul's response. And immediately there fell from his eyes. This is verse 18 of Acts 9. <clears throat> there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who is in Jerusalem destroying those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So <coughs> Ananias prays what seems like scales fall off his eyes, so he is now able to see again. Then he gets baptized. Then he takes food. Interesting. He's not been eating for three days and three nights. He's, he can see. He's no doubt hungry. He has been praying. That much we know. But he gets baptized first. He seals that new relationship with Christ by getting baptized. Then he takes food. Saul received his physical sight back but he was no longer spiritually blind. At the start of this journey, he could physically see, but he was spiritually blind that he would actually cause harm to God's people. And now the soul has a 180 degree turn because of his encounter with the living God. And he is now no longer spiritually blind or physically blind. Saul confirms his decision by choosing to get, get baptized immediately. And this brings to a, just a comment where I come across a lot of Christians who say yes to Jesus, but then they just hold off on getting baptized sometimes for months and years. And I could never figure out why that was. They always had these all weird excuses. And then, you know, I always tell these people, you know, there are two clear examples. There are multiple examples, one being Jesus himself, who really didn't have a need to get baptized, but he said it is to fulfill all righteousness. It should be done. And then you have the Ethiopian eunuch who looks at, there's some water, why shouldn't I get baptized? And then you have Saul himself who was you know, uh, fasting and praying for three days and nights. He's, he gets his sight back and he immediately gets baptized before feeding himself. If anyone tells you, oh, you know, I'm just waiting for the right moment or anything like that, there is no right moment. You have to call it out for what it is. It's just disobedience. If there's no real legitimate reason to delay because something just doesn't work out or you don't have time or whatever, that's okay, fair enough. Oh, but I'm going to do it. Or, oh, I don't know. You know, I just, I just haven't felt, and I just haven't felt the spark, and that's all baloney. Call it out for what it is, okay? Because that's exactly what it is. The act of obedience, of saying yes to Christ, is followed by the act of the obedience of getting baptized. Simple as that, okay? So now, that's not all he does. He then begins to immediately preach that Jesus is the Son of God. So, just days ago, he was zealous to put an end to the way and to arrest the people who were following the way. Next thing you know, he's saying, no, 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 this Jesus is the Son of God. And everybody is rightfully dumbfounded because they're going, isn't this the person who came here with explicit permission and authority to put an end to these people and to all the people who call on this name. Now what is he doing? Now he's preaching this name, that Jesus is the Son of God. Not just in street corners or anywhere. He's actually going to the very synagogues and preaching the very message that he was against just a few days ago. And we see the life-transforming power of Jesus. That someone who was 
once a murderer with murderous intent and murders a threat to God's people have now become a spokesperson for the very for the very Lord that he was trying to fight against. So <clears throat> nothing stopped Saul, not his past, not what he had done, nothing hanging over his head. He had an encounter and he obeyed because God had a plan and a purpose for him. Now the question then is for us, what's stopping us from stepping up and stepping out in doing what God's calling us to do? What's stopping us? It didn't stop Saul. Now we could say, oh yeah, he had great learning and this and that. Notice that he actually spent time in fellowship with the disciples. He didn't just go, no, now I know everything. He spent time in fellowship. He spent time with the disciples, getting strengthened and getting encouraged. And then he steps out and he goes, why wait? Led by the Spirit, because it says, you know, he continued to grow in strength. He continued to grow in strength because of God. One minute he was being led in the flesh. Next minute he's being led by the Spirit. And people begin to respond to the message of the gospel that he's preaching. Saul began to preach Jesus Christ as the Son of God, amazing everyone. And God caused Saul to grow in strength. So what's stopping us from stepping up? But then that's a challenge. It's not meant to make us feel bad more than it is meant to reestablish perhaps a, a weak relationship, I don't know, or step into a stronger relationship with God where we do hear Him when He calls, where we do respond, and we are able to act because His Spirit leads us. But the comfort then is God can use anyone. Saul didn't get used by God because he had credentials. Saul got used by God because he obeyed, because he responded, because he said yes. Every one of us sitting here, we've said yes to Jesus. We've got His Spirit according to the Word. We've got His Word which is we hold in our hands. We've got everything that we need. The question then is, do we believe that God can use us or are we busy making excuses that no, not me? Somebody else, oh look, that person can speak very well. That person's got education. That person's got life experience. What am I? I'm a nobody. God can't use me. To be honest, that's just very sorry excuses that we actually make for ourselves because we are afraid of what God could do, not just in us, but through us. Because when we step out, God's going to strengthen us. The same God who strengthened Paul, sorry, strengthened Saul, is a God who dwells in us. His Spirit dwells in us. He's the one who strengthens us. Now, I could... I know in my own life that everything that God has accomplished in and through me, I cannot take credit for it. Because if I were to make a list of all the ways I am not good enough, all the ways I don't qualify, all the things that I have done or haven't done that disqualifies me in all these different ways, that would be a very long list. But then, now, today, I can stand and say, greater is He who is in me. Through Him, in Him and through Him, much has been accomplished and much remains to be accomplished. So it's not for my credit or for my pride or for my ego, but it is all for God's glory. And I am no different from anybody in this room. God is able. God can use. Do we allow Him to? Have we allowed Him into our lives? Have we allowed, allowed Him into our hearts? Have we given His Spirit the authority and the permission? He's not going to break down walls and say, I'm going to do it whether you like it or not. He's going to ask us. He's going to want us to work with Him. He's got the power. He's got all that we need. But He needs, He wants us to say, yes, here I am. He wants us to be like Ananias. He wants us to be like Saul post-conversion, ready, willing to step up and step out. Let's pray.